You are tuned to the Nighttime Podcast, focused on the fringe of Canada. To start, like just for people who are who will be watching this that don't know your story or Riley's story, could you maybe just start by getting a bit of an introduction, like who you are and you know what your background is before this? Okay. Well, uh, my name is uh, Tracy Lang, and I am a mom of two, and I live in the Eastern Townships, which is like uh, basically on the border of Vermont and. Uh, Quebec, so it's very similar to Nova Scotia with its proximity to Maine, and mm -hmm. so we have, uh, you know, a different type of, uh, you know, mindset. It's more of a rural. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of diversity here. I uh, graduated of Bishop's University. I work for the federal government as a for Statistics Canada, and, and get to talk to a lot of people across Canada which I thoroughly enjoy. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my children are, were, I, it, this is always so difficult, you know, I have uh, two kids. I have uh, Riley Farrell and I have Fred Reagan. Uh, my son was 17 years old when he was killed. And my son was, my son was really handsome. He was really funny. He worked part-time at the IGA, which is the, you know the the community grocery store. I live in a population of maybe five thousand okay. regular, and probably eight thousand in the summer because I live in in the lake community. So uh, we have no uh, police uh, like services. We have we are run or governed, I guess, by the Sotheeds Quebec. And my son worked at the the cash at the fast cash. You know the twelve articles or less. Uh, he was one of the first boys to be uh, hired at that job as a cashier, and he was uh, funny, and he made people laugh. He was really the star of that uh, of that store. Uh, my son at school had uh, some difficulties in certain classes. In some classes, he was he excelled at, and other classes he he didn't quite excel and which brought a lot of uh, conflict with the teachers and the administration so he did struggle a lot uh, at school so when he was working at the IGA because when the kid when the teachers used to talk about my son I never recognized him and when he started working at the IGA and I would meet people in the street like I'm a first responder so a lot of people know me and they would be like, oh, my God, your son, he's great. He's funny. He's going to go places. He's so social. Uh, he's not normal, like, because he talks and makes jokes to adults. He's not intimidated. So it made me so proud. And so, you know, I I was looking forward to his future. And uh, Riley did struggle with some um, some depression. Um it started around the age of 12. His granddad died. His, uh, he had a couple pets die. I mean, it, his parents are divorced. Uh, I got divorced. I'm sure that affected him in some way. And like I said, it was a bit rough at school. Uh, he had a bit of intimidate, um, we call that intimidation in French. Uh, I might mix up my words a bit, but there's some bullying a bit at school. Um, but I do believe that when he entered high school, uh, the bullying or the intimidation came from a lot from the teachers. And hmm. I know it's not a popular opinion, um, but it's one that I'm going to to stand by. Uh, the school let me down. Uh, they let him down a lot. And they're cognizant of that fact. Hmm. Uh, my daughter still goes to that high school. So um you know that's another thing you know you always have to to be careful you don't want to step on any eggshells but yeah uh so graduation uh riley didn't graduate high school but uh he did finish high school you know he was in secondary five so he was gonna have to do a couple of classes that he was uh, signed up for to do in the fall uh he was uh, still working at the iga uh, full time and uh you know, we were making plans. He really liked fashion. He he liked buying clothes and selling clothes online. So mm -hmm. we were starting to set up a little like e-store type thing, you know, for him because he used to buy a lot of stuff. And I would be like, what are you doing? You know, I had no idea. I didn't have the vision I have now. And 
So uh, he liked Xbox. He had a lot of friends, you know. Um, he was really a typical teenager. Uh, what's hard with depression in teenagers is it looks a lot like being an adolescent uh, mm. kid. Yeah, and with with Riley with his depression, like I know it it comes out in, in different ways for different people. A lot of people will just appear like introverted. How did his depression like manifest itself? Like, what visible signs were there that he was suffering from something? Uh, the visible signs uh, were hard to see for the ex external world. Uh, mm -hmm. I just saw that he was sad, that he had sadness, and that he didn't uh, he didn't have a lot of self-confidence mm -hmm. um he he was very sensitive and he was always sensitive like even as a child he was sensitive to medication like he never liked to take tylenol you know when babies teeth um he always wanted to have friends so you know like i he like i remember in kindergarten like i really wanted him to toughen up and I remember the kindergarten teacher was saying, well, there's so many boys that aren't sensitive and, you know, yeah, but I'm like, when it's, if a boy, if somebody doesn't want to play with them, he has to be able to adapt and, and, and find a new friend. Whereas, you know, Riley would try really hard to, to make that person like him. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was, um, for me, that's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. Like I know at school, uh, they never saw it, um, quite in the same way uh, he was more um i don't want to say aggressive but you know maybe mouthy uh <laughs> sometimes uh, he didn't pay attention and he it manifested himself as being a little loud you know and mm -hmm. so in those ways so again you know it, it's again like adolescence he he was uh, introverted i'm pretty introverted but you know he was able to work at the fast cash and, and be very social and, and make lots of uh lots of acquaintances and friendships mm -hmm. you know and, and was his depression was it something that it was to the point that he was like getting treatment or help or was it or was it more something you thought he was just going to like grow out of um when he was 12 years old uh i did send him to you know to a uh, a psychologist and or like 13, I think it was in sec two. So he had to have been 13, 14, because I couldn't go with him. Mm -hmm. uh, Riley never went to the doctor. Riley was never sick. Uh, Riley, I said it before, he never took medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, he had headaches. I didn't like to just take Tylenol. He just mm -hmm. couldn't swallow pills. He couldn't as a baby. I used to put it in his bottle and he it just a little bit with juice and he would detect it. So. He was left-handed. I've heard that left-handed people are very uh, in tune to certain things. And I see that in, in him and his dad and my other left-handed friends. So anyway, so it was more in that way. So here in Quebec, I'm not sure what it's like in Nova Scotia, but at 14 years old, you're allowed to make your own health decisions. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to go to the doctor, you don't go to the doctor. You, you, it's, it's very difficult. Um, especially in the mental health department, I didn't feel that I was, uh, not that Riley didn't, wouldn't want me there, but I feel like that the health professionals, it's not an open, even an open subject because mm -hmm. either they feel that your child has something against you, you, that I'm the problem, that his dad's the problem, that there's a problem that they're not going to talk about. But I believe that the first few times that you see them, that it's important that you have your input and, you know, and, and she used to give Riley a lot of homework that he just didn't, wouldn't do. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, so he just stopped going mm -hmm. and we had started going again because Riley had had a couple of concussions, which, you know, could have led to some of the depression as well or to the, the things, you know, the, like I, I Riley's never attempted suicide. He's never, um, I've never, I've worried about him uh, more than I worry about my daughter, but it never in that way. Like I never, never expected this to happen ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never, I, you know, I, I never, I had razor blades around the house cause I paint a lot. And so, you know, it's good for scraping paint. I never hid my medications or, you know, it was never a, we talked about uh, suicide. My boss's brother had died by suicide just a few weeks before. I have relatives that have died by suicide. 
So it was, um, you know, something that we, we talked about. So mm -hmm. in the last year I did send him, he, he was welcome to going to a psychologist, someone that, um, is more of a neuropsychologist. And so he was going through treatment in the beginning of January, 2018 until March, 2018. And, um, and then it just kind of like slipped off, uh, whether it's because of me or because of him or, you know, I just don't know in my eyes, uh, Riley was doing great. Like mm -hmm. I saw such a change and it was probably the consultations with him, but I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if I didn't ask Riley enough, like, do you want to go or is, you know, should I set up an appointment? Um, I know in April he'd started playing rugby and then he had an accident and bumped his head again. And then we couldn't, so, you know, he had a lot of tests. Uh, the teachers, the, the psychologist had given a plan to the school. I met with the school in April and they had not even looked at the plan. Oh. So, mm -hmm. What, you, what happens is it's a lot of discouragement all this, a lot. And I was seeing the end of school and we had kind of just said, all right, you're not going to get through this school year. You're not going to graduate. You're not going to, let's just get through it and let's make it the best you can. Like, and Riley always wanted to go to school. He wasn't a kid that didn't want to go to school because, you know, I probably would never have sent him mm -hmm. because I, I always felt like, you know, Christmas vacation, I got him feeling good again. And then he'd go to school and, you know, like, Teachers sometimes don't say the right things. I heard it during Zoom last year. You know, I, I hear things. I, they don't listen to the kids. It's always, a, you know, and I don't want to put the teachers in all the same vacuum as I do the kids, but it's, it's the same, you know, it's the institutionalized mm -hmm. way but I, of thinking. Mm -hmm. But I guess, but leading up to J July of, of 2018, his like depression, it was, a, a part of his life and it was a problem but it wasn't the kind of thing where you were panicking and you know and, and it was in dire straits especially the last five weeks because i mean you know we had gone through school like he'd gone through a lot of things at the graduation and you know he it, to me he was looking up we were you know that day he'd received some clothes from some vendor for free mm -hmm. like a pair of shorts with white stripes and we'd kept the packaging and we, you know, like, so the last few weeks he was really great. You know, like I said, we were looking forward towards the future. Uh, you know, things were going good at the job. Well, I mean, he would, had given his notice for the job, but that's because he was going to do adult ed. He works in a canteen at fairs. The fairs were coming up. So he's going to be able to make a lot of money in mm -hmm. a short period of time. So no way in my mind that I, expect this to happen and especially you know the way it happened you know mm -hmm. so i i was uh you know riley like if uh, if he was mad at me or, or mad at his dad he would always text us like you know random times i love you you know and i was like oh you know he's either you know it's something happened whether it was a girlfriend or a, a friend you know it was just kind of like a code word so you know, that leads me to, you know, that's how I found out that my son was struggling a lot harder than I expected. Um, the day of July 25th, 2018, I, or the 24th, which is a Tuesday, uh, Riley went to the water park. There's a water park here with his friends. I think something may have happened there now, you know, but like I went and picked him up at uh, like 5.30 and it was really hot. And it's really humid. It was really humid. And him and I both get headaches when it's the humidity is high. So he had a headache and he went in his room and was playing Xbox. I made some cheap grilled cheese. Uh, he came out, nothing seemed off. I mean, he looked grumpy, but not like I, it wasn't like a depression. He wasn't crying. He wasn't mad. He wasn't, it was really nothing. Uh, I went to bed at nine o'clock. Uh, he was still playing. It wasn't anything abnormal this is what we do and um at 1 42 in the morning i received a text message from him that said i love you and i uh 
I tried to call him. I, I asked him where he was. I said I'd call 911, which I don't know why I would say that, but you know, I figured that would, I don't know. I figured I'd call 911. I don't know why I was so worried. So, um, uh, so, so you were just like at home in bed and got this text and you had, yeah. I, I'm assuming you thought he was in his room sleeping or something. Yeah. Well, at first I thought he was in his room sleeping. So I sleep downstairs. I went upstairs and he wasn't in his room. So that's when I texted back, where are you? And we have a beach like here that's not far. So I figured that maybe he went there. So like I said, it was really hot. I don't have air conditioning. So I went downstairs to get changed, to get dressed. And there was a note in front of my door uh, that he had written uh, to me. Uh, so I picked it up and I read it. And so I kept trying to call him and it was going directly to voicemail. And uh, so I decided to get in the car and just go. So I kept texting him and I never called 911. I, I was gonna go to the beach and when I left to go to the beach, I crossed the first responder, which in this town, uh, the ambulances are very far. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, two people that are on 24-7 uh, at all times. They're like pre-ambulance. So they know how to do first aid. They know CPR. Uh, we can do everything. Uh, anaphylactic shock, diabetes. So we prepare uh, the patients we usually re arrive within seven minutes, where is crucial if you want to reanimate someone and save mm -hmm. lives. So I cro I passed her, and I knew who she always worked her Tuesday nights, and where she was coming from, I knew it was her. So I I don't for what some reason I just turned around, and I followed her, and I arrived on the scene of. Um, a lot of police cars. I could see there was someone on the ground because I could see my, the first responder, her name's Helen, doing CPR. Oh. Cause it's like, a, she, her back was to me. I couldn't see who was on the ground, but I knew she was doing CPR because it's a, it's a move that if you've seen it, you know it. And so I knew that's what was happening. And so I ran out of my car with my, I, don't, I think I had my phone and I ran toward, there was police cars. They already had the tape up. This was like 1.50 in the morning, 1.56 mm. in the morning. So it's 15 minutes after Riley texted me. There were lights everywhere and I couldn't count the police cars, but I could see them. You know, I could see one there. I could see lights over there and lights over there. And a police officer, she was a woman, she stopped me. And I said, I think that's my son. But I didn't, she didn't even ask me, like, just like, well, why do you think that? And I said, well, because I got a note and he sent me this text. And that means, you know, and I said, he's depressed or he's depressive. Like, you know, I, like that. And you say, you know, he has issues, not like in the moment, but, you know, and that's what I said. I said, you've been doing so well the last few weeks. I wasn't worried. And I said, I, I think it's him. And she's, and she, she grabbed me by the arm and she said, well, you can't, I, I don't know if it's him and, and you wouldn't want to see the person that way. And so she started walking me towards my car and she said, can I see the note? And I said, yes. So we go, because during this time, I'm thinking my son had thrown himself in front of a car. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought, because Did I don't have firearms in my house. No, I don't okay. have water pistols in my house. I have no, none of that stuff. And Riley had been here for a couple of weeks, you know, maybe a week. And his dad lives probably two kilometers away. And I will say that I thought he was too lazy to walk over there and get something. Like I really did never cross my mind that there was either a, a BB gun or that he would go do that. Like mm -hmm. I just, if she asked me, I think about firearms and I said, no, no, I don't have that at my house. I, I, you know, and again, like no fire, no water pistols, nothing. And so she's like, well, can I read the note? So we went in my car. I sat in the passenger driver's seat and she sat in the passenger seat. And I should have known at that time that something was wrong, you know, because never have I ever seen a police officer sit in a passenger seat of a car you know I could have left with her I could have and she just started asking me questions and I told her my life story mm -hmm. and I and I basically told her how long I've been worried about Riley which was five years I said it I said I've been worried about him for five years 
since he was 12. And that's what I kept. And like where I was sitting, there was like, um, there's like a windmill. It's like a small decorative windmill. And I kept thinking like, how could he, how could he have jumped that far? Cause I couldn't understand how he had died. Cause all the cars, the lights that I saw, I assumed there was another car. Like, I couldn't believe, like, I live in a small town that there would be that many police cars 10 minutes after an incident. The police station is 16 kilometers away. It's the middle of a night on Tuesday, Wednesday morning. You know, it's, I mean, they roll out the sidewalks here. It's, you know, nine o'clock. It's very quiet. So, I assumed that's why I assumed all of those things and the police never interjected hmm. anything. Yeah. And let me just ask about this note that you, that he had left you and that you shared with the police. Did that indicate that he intended to do himself harm? Is like, am I? Yeah. It, just it indicated that he never said that he was going to die by suicide, shoot himself or anything like that. But it said that he, that he was going to do something that, and I wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. Okay. Basically, that's what the note said, was that we wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. Okay. So you, I worried about him. I worried about him that he was fragile. Like, I get my feelings hurt really easy. Hmm. Like, I'm super sensitive. You know, you, I can ask any of my friends. I cry easy, but I get over it. And I, you know, and I, and, it, and he used to get over it either, but he was very sensitive to when you didn't, you know, like any teenager, if you... You know, he's doing the best he can, and he, he seemed to always be getting knocked down. Mm -hmm. it, that was my opinion. So, you know, I was always rooting for him. And so, you know, and Riley, because over the months and over the years, there was, you know, that's my first note. Um, being in tune with my son, I could read between the lines, you know. I mean, you know, what does it mean? Like, he wasn't answering me. So, but I really soon, you know, I've been on, as a first responder, I've been on many calls um, where patients have called in, um, loved ones have called in, notes have been found. Uh, the person trying to die by suicide is, is calling in and they're calling in for help. Mm -hmm. And so in my opinion, I was going to help my boy, mm -hmm. you know, like the note meant nothing to me. I never expected him to when I found him to him not be alive ever never expected that so when that happened because I knew he was dead when she was doing CPR there was no doubt in my mind he was dead you don't do CPR on someone who's unconscious so so at that point it was the question for you was more like what had happened at, at what point did they did did they tell you like this is Riley and Amazing enough, like, it never occurred to me to ask them what happened. Huh. And I don't know why, because as a first responder, I've been in several uh, interventions with the police, whereas, like, I've been taught in my classes to, but I arrived as a parent, right? So, mm -hmm. that if you go on a scene and someone's uh, hanging and the police are not letting you to a scene, that we must record them. And say what's your badge number and tell me that you're not allowing me to the scene we record them with our defibrillator and usually we get access to the patient because they want to protect the scene at all costs so but i went there as a parent and i went there as a citizen and thinking that the police were looking out for me and when she said that i can't confirm or that it's him and you wouldn't want to see him that way. I it always I just kept thinking he got hit by a car. He threw himself in front of a car. And I had called my ex-husband in the meantime. And where the intervention happened was at an intersection. So they had blocked off the intersection. And my Riley's dad was coming from the opposite way. So the western way or northern way. And I was coming the southern way so he had to cross the to the police tape and the when he was met he knew one of the police officers and he said it's going to be transparent don't worry and like 
when he came to me, he's like, he thought for sure Riley had shot himself because I kept asking him, you know, because the cops, I kept asking him about firearms, like, you know, like, and I guess they were asking me, but I was like, well, I don't know anything about firearms. So, right. He thought that. So at the end, I always thought my son had harmed himself. Okay. So I said, they said, well, go to the hospital and they're, you're going to find out there because Riley left in the hospital. So I, we went to the hospital and Larry arrived earlier because the road was blocked. I had to go do a big detour. No one offered me a ride. Uh, Larry's girlfriend was with him, so she drove him. And Larry is Riley's dad. Right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's okay. Riley's dad. And so when I arrived there, Larry, Riley's dad, Larry, and the cop and his girlfriend and a nurse were outside yelling because that's where the hospital is. So I arrived and I parked. And my my role in pretty much life is a, I'm the calm person, like. I come in, I can diffuse situations quite easily. I, I'm i just able to do that. And like, especially with Larry, you know, I've known him for a long time. So, and he was talking English and the cop was talking French and I could hear you, you she won't talk French or English to me. And it's always a question around here. Mm -hmm. It's a thing. And so I went in and I was like, he's like, she wants me to go in the small room. I know what she's going to say to me. And I guess the small room is where they give you the bad news that your son's died. Because no one still has confirmed anything. So we eventually go uh, wait in the waiting room. And it's so long that it's even unimaginable. So the doctor comes with a nurse and the police officer. It, this woman police officer, and her name is uh, Officer Hassan. I know her now just because I made a complaint against her, but I know her name, Officer Hassan, is there with the doctor and with the nurse. And every time we see the doctor or the nurse, this cop is there every time. Hmm. And so, and it, we still, I, we're not putting two and two together because while we were waiting, Larry's like, oh, he must have, you know, he goes, I, I stopped back home and I saw he left me a note and, you know, I look, I didn't look for, I, he just went, I know he went straight to the hospital. So he's like, he must have taken the, you know, he must have taken my rifle and it must be this. And, you know, so I was like, okay, he shot himself, you know? And so the police officer or the doctor said, uh, I'm here to tell you that your son has died. And uh, Larry asked, can we see him? And the police officer said in French, no, because the police are there. And Larry left. She's like, we're going to come back in a few minutes and tell you what happened. And Larry left. He's like, I don't need to hear anymore. They won't talk English. You know, he's having a fit about that. So he left. And it's probably around 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning at this time. So over an hour and a half, and we're still thinking that Riley died by suicide. Seriously, I, I had come to terms with it, actually. Uh, after an hour, you come to terms with so much, you know, and nobody was telling me different because they knew that's what I was thinking. And they knew I had said Riley's name several times. They, they had the letter because I left it with them. I had no idea that I had to protect myself. No. So after a few minutes, I went to see the receptionist at the emergency room. I said, I'm waiting for the cops to tell me what happened. I said, I'm the mom of the little boy they just brought in, you know? And they're the cop, that woman, Officer Hassan, is like having a laugh with the doctors and turns around and sees me and, and makes like this surprise, like she had forgotten me there. So she grabs the nurse and we meet in that little room that's probably four by four. It's really small because I was almost knee to knee with her, with that Officer Hassan, and she's looking at me straight and... She's telling me that her job is she's the, the liaison for the hospital. So when awful incidents happen, they call her. She comes in. She meets with the parents and she has this discussion. And I said, OK, so I'm kind of feeling bad for her because she has a pretty shitty job as, you know, as to give the bad news. And mm -hmm. and I, I, I am kind of that person. I can make a conversation. You know, I had come to terms and been over an hour and a half. And I was desperately waiting to hear what had happened. So I asked her what happened. And she said, do you really want to know? 
And I couldn't believe that she was first saying that. Mm -hmm. And then she said, um, I, I said, yeah, of course I want to know. And she said, well, so we received a call from 911 um, that someone that there was a, a, a man menacing in the street with a firearm yelling in crisis. And, and she said, and uh, when the police arrived, um, it was your son and he died within a police during a police intervention. And that was that. And I was like, and I looked at her and I said, are you telling me that you shot my son? And like, when I say you, I meant like her outfit, her colleagues. And she said, yeah. And I, and I just looked at her and she had, I'll never forget her face. She had um, Kevlar on her body armor on to hear. She had a radio and she had boots to hear. And she had, it looked like Kevlar here, like on her feet or like she, she was pretty protected, you know, like I, all I could see was her face and her, her knee, her legs, her knees were even covered. And I, and I went, I go, you, I looked at her and I went, you were afraid of him. And she said, yep. And that was it. And I just called Larry. I told him what happened and then. I hung off the phone real quick and she gave me her, she said that uh, she'd heard several things like that before about what Larry had said and that she'd heard worse and that she understood and that she had sympathy for us. And um, was there anything she could do for us? And, and I was in shock, you know, once again, it was like my son had died all over again because I was trying to place to piece everything that had happened because I couldn't figure out how, I don't even know. I can't even remember if she told me that he had a firearm, I'm sure, because she had said it during the 911 call. Mm -hmm. And so I went to, uh, I left, I, they, they asked me, the doctor came and asked me if I needed anything. I asked for prescription of marijuana because it was like September or July and I knew it was becoming legal in October. And then I laughed and I said, no, I said, it's okay. I said, I know you just like to prescribe opioids. And I left like, and I, and I seriously said that. And I said, no, no, I'm okay. I said, I'll call my own doctor when I go home. Wow. Cause I had felt, I felt betrayal to the, then I, now I can say the words cause I didn't understand the feeling that I had, but it was total betrayal from the minute I arrived on the scene to I arrived at the hospital, till I left the hospital. I have not stepped foot in that hospital since then. And, you know, whether to get care for myself or, you know, it's, I go to different hospitals now. So it, it was very, uh, it was very disheartening, really. It was complete betrayal that they had never mentioned that to me, ever. And that they had let me talk and talk, you know? And so at this point, I still didn't know where he had been shot. That that took a long time. And it's it's really tragic, the whole sequence. So. Mm -hmm. And now like this, there's been three years since this happened and there, there's still a lot you don't know, but so much of this story has become your quest to figure out what happened to hold the police accountable maybe just to start talk to me through like a bit of what you've been able to learn about riley's activities leading up to this interaction with the police and maybe also tell me how you were able to learn this because because as i understand it they didn't just say like here's you know our receipts to show you what happened oh no uh, no so i like i said before i said within about a month like the the it's the Independent uh, Bureau of Investigations. I'm going to call it the BEI. And mm -hmm. um, you can, it sounds like they, like she. Okay. They, so it's how it's spelled. So the BEI, it's how it, the acronym in French arrived and told me it was going to be independent, it was going to be transparent, that there were rules and that there were regulations and that it was just like this. So within about a month, I was. The one that was, a lot of people had come to me and like, there was one woman who had come to me who lived right next door and had heard the intervention and no one had called her. 
So I called the BI, told them there was a witness. And then like the first responder is the one that told me that there was no CPR being done on Riley when she arrived, that the police officer was holding Riley in her arms and saying, keep your eyes open. And she was being very gentle with him, but she was holding him in her arms. So there was no CPR. In fact, she said to me, I thought I was late and I couldn't understand why all these police officers were there not doing CPR. So I told the BEI, you haven't, you haven't interviewed her. It took them three months to interview her. So from about those times, I started reaching out to people like through Facebook, through organizations um, that had been involved in these same types of situations mm -hmm. as I have. And I met a man named Alex Sound Popovich and I met uh, Bridget Tolley. She's an advocate. Her website is Justice for Police, uh, Victims of Police Killings. And her mom was killed uh, by an SQ police car uh, in 2000 on uh, reservation and it was investigated by his cousin and uncle and there were no charges so she's been on a quest for a long time and it was through these people that I realized that I had gone down a place that was that no one you can't even believe the obstacles and the protection and all I wanted to do was to, to find out what had happened. So I was told that I was gonna get a meeting at the end of the investigation with the BEI. I was told that I was going to get a meeting with the prosecutor's office, the Crown. And uh, so I made sure those things happened because I knew in other interventions and with other families that the things didn't happen. I'm going to say I never hired an attorney, which I think is what really saved me because the minute an attorney gets involved, they don't want to talk anymore. And I had a really good relationship with the, the liaison officer from the BEI that they sent to me. I think he was as transparent as he could be with me. And within a month, he told me to look up because it was at the same time as there was a big commission here, an inquiry against um, up north in Val d'Or. There was some accusations against the SQ officers from Aboriginal women where they were taking them on starlight tours, rape, in exchange for drugs. And there was a big, uh, the Radio Canada had done a, a huge reporting on it and broke the story wide open and so that became an inquiry and the BEI told me to watch it and my advocates and the advocates told me to watch it so I was like oh this is interesting and there was the SQ defending their points the BEI defending their points and then all the problems so I figured that I wasn't alone and that there was some val validity to my questions and just, I never let them up. So I wrote a lot of letters of access of information. I, I read a lot of access of information because a lot of people may have already asked the same questions. You can actually copy and paste the same letter and change for the things that you want, mm -hmm. because those are the only ways that you can make uh, complaints or get information. I was told to, to go to police ethics, not by the BEI, which is their mandate to tell you, but that's basically the only place and you only have a year. So if you think that they use excessive force, and even if you don't know the cop's name and you don't know what happened and you don't know anything, still do it because you really only have a year and they're gonna hold you to that. And if you go past a year, then it's up to you to prove that you didn't know that there was something wrong and it's such a mm. game but i've learned all the rules or most of the rules and still learn them each day so i just kept doing that so when i had uh, the opportunity to meet the bei I, I had questions for them i told them i wanted to hear the 911 call i told them that i wanted to hear the declaration because they're the police are mandated to give a declaration if you're implicated that means you shot or had direct contact with the subject which is riley they don't call them victims 
and um, the other ones are witnesses. So Riley, uh, so the cops, the implicated, had to talk within 24 hours, and they just have to, they have to answer, they don't have to answer questions. I thought they did, but they only have to meet because in the law, they only wrote, you have to meet with the BEI. Okay. They didn't write and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Had they written that and answer questions, but now, because we've made lots of complaints, so now they've realized that they made the law wrong. So mm -hmm. the cops only have to show up and they don't have to answer questions. But after the incident, they do have to write a declaration and they have to do it as soon as possible. They have to be separated from each other. And so I asked when I had the meetings, I asked for the the declarations of all the police officers and the 911 call because I knew they couldn't refuse that to me. Mm -hmm. Like you have to be careful what you ask, right? Because if you ask for too much, then they're going to say no to everything. So it's almost like, you know, I'm sure they, I'm, I'm called Madame Wing and they must see my name. And it's the same with my friend, Alex Popovic, you know, like he makes complaints against all types of uh, police interventions and he's been fighting this battle. He has no stake in it except for justice. And he's, it's, he's been quite an ally and he has his own website. It's the coalition for like, it's called the crap. So if you look crap.org, it's uh, lacrap.org. He, he names the victims. Uh, because, you know, we don't have a database in Canada uh, naming the police victims. So I got all those things that I asked for. Wow. And, like, I didn't tell them that I was bringing my lawyer friend to the meeting. I didn't tell them that I was bringing my friend Alex to the meeting. Mm -hmm. I just brought them. And they, if, I said, they said, I said, can I bring people? And they said, yes. And I said, okay. So, so you think if you were if you were bringing an attorney or something, this you don't think they would have played those call the call I for you? I think they would have played those calls for. Well, I think they may have because they had already said yes. But I think if it had been my attorney that had written the request, mm -hmm. then they would have said no because mm -hmm. it happened to other families, you know. And if this is a, you know a, something that you want to follow through, I can give you names of other families that. It's the same, you know, and we were, it's, it's, I was, I, I hate to even say lucky, you know, because I didn't have to sue the BEI in order to get information. I didn't have to hire an attorney. I just had to stick to my guns and to play by their rules. And that's what I did. I, I use my words very carefully. I never say they're murderers. I never say they're killer cops, you know, I, I can think things in my head, but you know, I'm fair with the media because I, I know the position that they're in as well. Like, I can't be, I don't want to be seen as a, a lunatic, vengeful mom. I I want, so it's uh, it's something that I'm um, quite adaptable at. I'm, a, I'm as, so, Riley didn't get his social skills from, you know, the neighbors. He got them from me. You know, we're very adaptable. We're, we're like, that introverts are kind of like that. We we adapt to what people are so we can get, you know, kindness from them, really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so I heard the 911 call. Yeah. So now before you hear the 911 calls, there was, it was still a mystery as, as to what happened from the point Riley left and sent you the text to you arriving on the scene is my understanding. Well, I had heard some things like the first responder had told me he got shot in the head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just one shot in the head that I knew I knew there were a lot of costs but I didn't know how many I knew or had a feeling that Riley was the one that had done the 911 no I I knew the BI did tell me that Riley was the one that made the 911 oh, okay so I did know that yeah so but I still believe that it was a cry for help you know mm -hmm. so I was very anxious to hear it because mm -hmm. there was no other calls to 911 which you know you sh should they should take that into consideration mm -hmm. you know like so i so those were the only things that i knew um because it was the same day that they the pro the crown decided not to accuse the police officers and it was at that day that i heard that the intervention took less than a minute Ooh, okay. i always believed and you can hear me because well 
you know, I recorded our Congress, our, the meetings. It's, it's what I did. Uh, you're not supposed to, but hey, what are they going to do? You know, like you have to have something. I'm not planning on broadcasting it, but I, I, I don't trust them anymore. And, and that's what they've done to me. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you, you're not paranoid if it's true. And I'm going to, you know, that it's every roadblock. So I was mad that they kept that from me because there is no reason for them to keep that. It took 61 seconds from the minute he was seen to the minute he was shot. Cause I always said it's six minutes. You can hear me say, Oh, I know they're like, it was very, the prosecutor goes, it was a very short intervention. And I'm like, yeah, I know it was about six minutes. And she says 61 seconds and I don't hear it until I hear the 911 call is when I realize how short it was so tell me about so the i'm assuming when you hear the call this you have to go to the police station or somewhere and meet with people to play it can, can you tell me about that experience and and describe what you hear in this call yeah uh so we heard uh the first time we heard it at the with the crown prosecutor and they were having a lot of trouble with their computer and so we had made a plan to meet the next the following week and the BEI said as many times as we need to meet Mm -hmm. so we met again at the at the uh at the justice what do they call it the courthouse Mm -hmm. so we met at the courthouse I think they did that um for legal reasons but also there's like a a bailiff there with a weapon in case we lose our minds like you know because they did give us back uh, the BB gun that Riley was holding like right there like hey it's it's quite insane uh the things that we've gone through so it was um what the police and what everyone's always telling you is that how hard it is it's going to be very hard for you to hear all of this it's going to be very hard it's like they don't realize that i'm living it Mm -hmm. and that there's nothing that's going to be harder then me putting all these scenarios together, making up this stuff, and then being wrong, and then him dying all over again. Mm-hmm. Like when I heard it was 60 wet seconds, it just, it was rough. Like it, it really took me a, a long time to get over it because it was worse than I believe. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're like, it's going to be really hard for you to hear. You know, it's his voice. Yes, I know. Like, can you stop thinking for the vic- for the victims and for the families? If we're telling you something, it's because we want it. Mm-hmm. If we didn't want to hear it, like I didn't want to hear anything they were telling me at the intervention. I didn't ask any questions because I didn't want them to tell me that my son had killed himself. That's why I didn't ask questions. You know, I'm one that if I don't want to know, I don't ask. You know, mm-hmm. after an hour, I'm kind of ready to ask a question. So it was... Uh, it was actually, it felt good to hear his voice. It felt good to hear his voice, to hear he was really calm. It bothered me, but it, he was not afraid. Um, it was good to hear him describe himself as chubby, <laughs> just a regular guy, not quite six foot, because it really bothered him that he wasn't six foot. Like, he was like 5'11 and a half, and, and he says that in the message, you know, in the 911, he's, he's just a regular guy, he's, he's just screaming, he's in crisis, that's all he was saying, like, Riley didn't sound scared for that person, you know, he, he was talking regularly, uh, he described him to a T, said he had a backpack, and uh so what i hear is that there's three cop cars that come Mm -hmm. and there's two cop cars because i one thing i didn't realize either is that there's no body cameras in quebec and there's no dash cams like i really thought that there would at least be a dash cam in the police cruisers but there's nothing like that i believe that riley may have uh because when I when I went to that meeting, they said that Riley was holding the gun in his left hand, the BB gun, it's an air pistol, in his left hand, and his phone in his right hand. Hmm. I believe Riley may have been filming it, but the BEI never thought it was pertinent to look. The Crown never thought it was pertinent to look in his phone. 
Wow. It's locked up. I'm going to wait. Somebody is going to be able to hopefully maybe hello. <laughs> you have me leave a comment. <laughs> like I, I have to break in somehow. You so know. Do you have the phone or do the police I have the phone? It's still in the envelope, like okay. the evidence envelope, because I think they may have tried to erase something. It may, might be in this cloud. It might be in this in the Apple ID. It's uh, a lot of things. It's very hard to get to Apple. Mm -hmm. And I have a hard time talking to people on the phone. I'd rather do things in person. I tried to go to the Apple store. They can't really help me there, you know. So I'm being patient, you know, with the inquiry. I'm hoping the coroner might want to do it. Okay. Or um, just one more question about the, the 911 call. Just so people understand is Riley made a 911 call reporting as if he was a witness to someone in distress. Exactly. But yeah. but he was describing himself. So he is he calling and saying like, yeah, I see this guy, you know, doing this on the street. But he's actually describing what he's doing. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, exactly. He just says he's walk. He said, so yes, Riley was describing himself. He said he's in front of the IGA. This guy, just a regular guy, teenager. He's screaming. He's like. I think that's all he said. He's screaming and he's walking towards Cowansville, which is a little town. And um, the dispatcher spent a lot of time asking him questions. Like, uh, do you hear what he's saying? Does he appear drunk? Um, and it's uh, Riley's English speaking and she's English speaking as well, but they're talking in French to other people. Okay. So I think like she's not quite understanding him. And I don't know if you understand, like when you call 911 on the telephone, it goes to a central and then that central sends it to like your community. Okay. So there were two like transfers. And so you can hear like the cops talking a little bit and like they're all getting ready. They're all gonna meet somewhere to talk mm -hmm. for seven minutes. They spend talking about the intervention and spend 60 seconds at it. It's mm. unbelievable to me. They would have waited that long. I would have arrived, you know, in, in the call with Riley, how does, how does that end? Does it end it with ends, the police arriving? Yeah, it ends as, uh, so he's, she's like, okay, well, I got your name. She took his name. She took his number. And he said, well, she's like, okay, well, we might call you back, okay? He's like, yeah, okay, bye, bye. It was like that. It was so nonchalant. Mm -hmm. But what happened when they met, one of the police officers called Riley back, and that is not recorded. Oh. And so he was calling back the person who called 911, right? So the person Riley was describing they didn't know that they were talking to the subject, to the victim, to Riley himself. They knew they were talking to Riley, but as the caller to 911. A witness rather than right, the subject. rather than the, the mm -hmm. person. And he said that Riley, that he asked Riley where he was, if he still had a visual on him. Because that's, you know, it's what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. And if he was safe. And Riley said that he was almost home. Riley gave him my address because on the news at 5 a.m., my mother heard the story and she heard my address oh. on TV. And it didn't even happen here. And so that 911 call got out because that's the only place you see my address is in the 911 call. Mm -hmm. But I'm learning this uh, 19 months after Riley died. It's mm -hmm. important that 19 months. So it's like it all happened all over again because I learned so much newer information. Mm -hmm. I learned, uh, so with that, that was basically the 911 call and that they called back. And in the 911 call, you hear them calling the cops to that meeting, but that's not recorded. The only time it's recorded is when they're talking to each other on the radio. And it doesn't happen very often because mm -hmm. At that meeting place, or right before the meeting place, they decided to call the 
the guy who has the uh what do they call him like the SWAT like, guy like a sniper SWAT yeah he's a sniper and he yeah. lives right up the street here <laughs> like he's two he's three kilometers from my town we all know him uh he's a he's a tall good looking guy and, and he's a he's been an sq forever and we all know him like i saw him that night at the scene in his van and so you hear the guy who's in charge the guy who called riley his name's wally you hear wally talk to luke the guy the sniper saying are you coming and you hear luke say yeah i'm at the i'm at one kilometer away and you hear wally go okay you know and then you hear he's there he's talking in french but he said he's there he's there and you hear luke go where and you hear wally say at chins and he says he has a weapon in his left hand he's at chins which is the old restaurant which is where he was and uh so when you hear him say he's there to when he you hear him say shots fired it's 61 seconds wow and had not they not been talking on that radio i never would know mm -hmm. that it was 61 seconds and i can look at you straight in the eyes all of you that is the truth i would never have known mm -hmm. that it was 61 seconds they would have been able to cover that up because i kept giving them six minutes so why would they have, you know that's my belief maybe that's not true maybe but i do believe that that would have happened you know i know in the declaration one of the cops says that it took less than a minute but uh so that changed everything for me it really changed everything for me they didn't negotiate with him they you can you don't negotiate in a minute yeah there's not much that can be said in a minute so the 911 call really gives you a picture of you know what led to the interaction and and through that allows you to figure out how long the interaction took but what information did you get about how the police actually handled their interaction with riley like did you learn anything about what they said or did to try to de-escalate him uh, well what they kept saying was uh drop your weapon and all will go well they said it in french they said it in english and they said it in english again and apparently they heard riley say two cops say they heard riley say i've been planning this for five years and that's what i told the cops <laughs> i told them that before i told them that at the hospital like i know they use my words but that's what they said that they heard Riley say. Uh, what do you mean you, to you told them that? Because when Riley, because when I, at the Crown Prosecutor meeting, Riley, because I can, I know more what happened with Riley, you know, what was going on in his mind. So he was playing on Xbox about 1030. He was playing cards. They were playing Uno. And then a friend of his, girlfriend, friend called and they got in an argument. Riley went on fit on Instagram, put a dark picture up, started texting his friends that he was feeling good, was thinking bad things. And that he wrote to one of his friends, I'm going to do something that I've never thought of before. That's what's, that's what they told me that he typed out. It's on Snapchat, right? So, then he, they show Riley show sends a picture of him with a the air gun on his leg. Apparently. Like a, an air gun would be, I would call it like a BB gun, like it would like shoot. A BB gun, and it looks really like a revolver. It, it really does look like a pistol, you know. Mm -hmm. But they they have a air cartridge on mm -hmm. the bottom, which mm -hmm. is what gets the BBs out. It's mm -hmm. like air compressed air, so mm -hmm. it's like a gas chamber type thing, but it's air, and so that was shown on the Instagram and like that girl was trying to call my daughter who had gone to sleep over, but she was, Reagan wasn't answering and nobody knew my number. And so they were trying to, his friends were trying, knew something was up. They were trying to get him, but it bothers me that they say that Riley texts this 
I'm going to do something I've been never thought of before, ever, and that the cops say that they heard Riley clearly say, I've been planning this for five years. Hmm. Two cops say that they heard that out of the six. Hmm. Maybe he did say it, you know, but that's, I guess, when... So that's all that was said, that that's, there was never any ne other negotiations. So there was never, Hey buddy, what's up? Uh, what are you doing? Are you okay? Or what's going on? Um, they decided that they would arrive with the lights off and they decided that they wouldn't have their sirens on or their lights or anything so that they would arrive below the speed limit. All the police officers are surprised when they find Riley, okay? Riley's in the middle of, the, not in the street, but basically under a light. Look at me, here I am. And they all say they're surprised that he's there. Even though Riley said at two occasions, the kid's walking towards Cowansville. That's where they met up with him. Hmm. They were driving into town slowly because they were looking for him. So when they found him, they were surprised. So I think they thought it was a crank call. Mm. I don't think they were prepared for what they were coming into. I don't know what they discussed um, at all because they won't tell me because that's a secret. Because what if I plan on doing something? I'm going to know how the police intervene. Mm. I know that they decided that one car would come in like this, the other like this, one like this, you know, mm. like... Uh, you can see a little bit. I don't know if how well you can see, but mm. like that's first car, second car, third car. And it's the second car that shot him. He was 30 meters, 32 meters away behind his cruiser. And the guy who says shots fired, who's talking to Luke in his declaration, well, I think three police officers say they're surprised to see Riley fall. They think Riley's shot the gun. But when they see Riley fall, they realize that he's been shot by a cop. Oh. So even at that time, no one else shoots a weapon. Hmm. And he meant to shoot him. Like that cop who shot Riley, his name is Joel Devis. So I got his name from the police ethics. Uh, shot him in the head to kill him. That's what he says. Like, mortal force necessary. That's in his declaration that he signed. And that's why I needed to hear the declaration because when they said that to me, I couldn't believe it. I, he can't, don't they have to shoot here in the chest mm -hmm. where your rib cage protects your vital organs? Your sternum and your chest protects your vital organs unless you're shooting for your heart. Shooting here will typically not kill someone. It'll hurt them real mm -hmm. bad. You know, even if you shoot here, it's, he shot him in the head to kill him. Mm -hmm. And Riley, like when you looked, like if Riley was standing 30 feet away from me or whatever, I, would I be able to tell he was a, like a young teenager or, or, or did he have like the physique of a man? I, just because in my mind, I feel like police would handle like a teenager in crisis different than an adult. Well, they knew he was a teenager because Riley had said it in the 911 call that he was just a kid. Huh. I mean, Riley was chubby. Um, I mean, he's almost six foot tall. Like, I think he, he was dressed in black. I mean, I'm sure, you know, he had a black uh, hat on or a beanie. I don't know what's in his book bag. I haven't opened it. Mm -hmm. um, but they say that he was, he had, that he was, doing um pacing mm -hmm. and that his arms were horizontal horizontal and vertical mm -hmm. so he was doing this and he was doing even at one point he did a 360 to do all of that in a minute is a lot mm -hmm. and to be able to shoot someone in the head to kill him he could have shot him somewhere else exactly yeah that was be that's because that's kind of was my first thought is if someone had a weapon and they were shot and the police shot them in the chest, which would be an easier target to hit as well, you would think. They're trained to shoot. They're trained to shoot in the chest. Your mass, center mass, 
It's the largest part on your body. Mm -hmm. It's a part on your body that does not move. See, your arms will move. Your chest never moves. I can mm -hmm. move my head. Mm -hmm. I can move my legs. But this is a big, it's the biggest part of your body and it's quite stable. And you're, there's a reason they shoot in the chest. Your, your sternum is there to protect you mm -hmm. and to protect your vital organs, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. Yeah. And ultimately the, the shot that was fired kills Riley and you did file complaints and there was some sort of internal investigation into whether the cop had done anything wrong. Can you talk a little bit about what you know about this investigation and what the ruling yeah, was? So I did a police, uh, an ethics uh, complaint in December of 2018. So just a couple of months after I made complaints in regards to the police officer himself. I made complaints against the, the police officers not doing CPR because Riley's uh, organs were not viable for harvest, no. which I know is a weird thing for me to say, but I'm an organ donor. I've, I myself have reanimated two people in my career as a first responder with a defibrillator. I've kept organs alive on one patient that went to seven people. Okay. Riley was well aware of that fact. He was an organ donor. Riley was a perfect candidate mm -hmm. for organ donation and they did nothing. Um, it's written on the BEI site that there was 911 performed. So I don't know if it's the cops saying that they did it or the BEI just writing whatever. So, um, and about how the police interacted that evening with each other and that the two police officers that were in the same car, I know they went to the hospital and I believe they were in the same ambulance. And I believe that they were in the same room because the BEI told me that the cop who met with us, Officer Hassan, was there to make sure the two cops didn't talk to each other. And I was like, well, she was always with the doctor. So there's no way because they didn't want, they were afraid that the doctor would tell us what had happened mm -hmm. before they had a chance to. Because the doctor would have told me. Mm -hmm. Because... You know, I, I ended up making a complaint against the hospital because they had no control over the hospital. We were treated very badly. We were we were treated as suspects, not victims, not people who are in distress. I received hospital cards after from the police station, like, were they looking into my files? Like, there's a lot of suspicious stuff that happened. So I've learned... Um, in March of this year, I learned from the police ethics that they're still investigating whether they did anything wrong um, through the intervention. Uh, apparently, the, the cops didn't take too long to call the BEI. Like, I had made a complaint that after that they waited too long to call the BEI. They waited 45 minutes. Apparently, that's not too long. Yeah. Um, that their internal directives or their protocols supersede provincial law mm -hmm. that is written right in the decision when the police ethics gives you a decision it's usually a rejection and then you get a lot of the facts you get a lot that's where i got the names of the police officers involved and i learned them march of 2021 mm -hmm. so it's um it's, it's, it's a really slow process. I still don't have an autopsy. I don't have the toxicology report. COVID hit, so now they're using that as an excuse for not having the public coroner's inquiry before. But no one in the coroner's office has looked at my son's file. Wow. Like, that's, that's very sad. And mm -hmm. people forget. And Yeah. And when, you, when I'm listening to the story, the way I hear it is from the very beginning you told them all the background information about yourself and riley the police then are alone and they're the only witnesses to what happened is like a small group of police officers in a small town yeah hmm. yes it's exactly what happened hmm. and the they told me when the prosecutor told me that the cops said that they heard riley say i've been planning this for five years First of all, a teenager thinks in five minutes. Mm. 
maybe five days, you know, not five years. Mm -hmm. Riley doesn't remember, you know, I don't believe it. I don't believe that that's a language that he would use. Mm -hmm. I believe that, you know, Riley was looking for help. You know, Riley brought his pillow and his, his phone charger. You don't bring that with you if you think you're going to be dying, you know, like mm -hmm. his phone charger. Like, come on, what teenager, you know, if they're not coming back, he would have left it for us, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, uh, they were left alone. So, but that's, I haven't heard yet about that part mm -hmm. of the, um, the investigation. It's very long. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the longer. I heard that now a police officer was in the ambulance with Riley. Oh. I have a feeling that it's the one that was holding her in her arm, his arms, and the one that met us at the hospital, mm -hmm. which will be even. So I have to add a complaint against her because it's even worse than I thought. Mm -hmm. You know. And now in in present day, like d despite this journey for information and this battle the many battles you've had to go through in this you're also known as as an advocate to prevent things like this from happening in the future i understand there was a petition that got a lot of coverage like thinking of riley's story and your experiences what are the changes that you've been seeking to see happen that would have either prevented riley from dying or maybe prevent other people like him you know, from ending um, up the same well, way. I, I really wanted to make the public aware um, first and foremost that it could happen to anybody. Like, really, like, we're in the midst of um, Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter, you know, and I believe in the cause for sure. Um, but when you live in a community that is as undiverse as mine, you know, I can I can count the the different families that don't look like us on one hand. Mm -hmm. So the police are still the police. They're still abusing force. So it was important for me to to make sure that the people who are making the laws who look exactly like me understand that this could be happening that can happen to their children. And and I do, I wish that it wasn't such a divisive. Because even within our, my families were divided, you know, I have a public inquiry because my boy was white and his is brown, mm -hmm. you know, so I wish I could get rid of all of that, but I can't. So mm -hmm. I'm going to speak for all of us and with my privilege that I do have and that I've seen, you know, in action, I know it's gotten me on in the media. I know, and I did that because I wanted to let the public know that this is really happening. It can happen anywhere, that it's happened in the past. I believe that Riley was a unique case and he's not. Um, I wanted to make sure that the police were aware that I was aware. So that's why, you know, like not having body cams and dash cams is just, I know we're technologically really behind as a country. Uh, COVID really put the spotlight on that, but I think that we're spending millions and millions of dollars in complaints and lawsuits and, and it, it shouldn't take a George Floyd mm -hmm. incident to change things. So I wanted to do the petition because I knew that would again get me in the media because I truly didn't believe that anything would happen from it because the square, the wheels of justice are very square. Um, but I knew it would, it would get talked about. I knew it would be a question on this, um, the table that they can't put aside. So um, I know here in Quebec, you have to do petitions a certain way. You can't use change.org because then they don't even have to look at it. So you know, as successful as it was, it, it, it could have been better and, and I haven't stopped. And so I was always, always been trying to get Riley's story, other family story in the media because in 2019, because I started speaking in December, in December, I think in December, November, 2018, there was, had been a small kidnapping in my town. And I met, there was a reporter at the Tim Hortons and I said, 
Do you want to do a story on me? Because I was sick of listening to the BEI say, don't go to the media and don't talk about it and don't do this and don't do that. And I was like, why don't they want me to? I've got nothing to hide here. You know, and I didn't like that it was, there was so much talk about Riley's depression and, and the suicide by cop, which is, you know, that's a subject for another day, but I know it's an angle that they're, which it's not a cause of death. Riley did not die by his own hand. And that's just the facts. He, it was a homicide. So, you know, I, it, in 2019, there was not one police officer in Quebec that shot to kill a citizen. Hmm. And then the years prior there, like in 2018, I, I wish Riley was the only one, but there was five or six, you know, and, and it's just, I, I have all those numbers, like really easy to grasp. I just don't have them in my head anymore because after listening to the declaration and the 911, it, the betrayal that I felt was so real that I didn't even, couldn't even express it. You know, I, I was doing really well with the YouTube. I was feeling good about it. Like, I mean, as a, as a self healing and self care, mm -hmm. it was so important and it was an important message for me to do. And I kind of stopped because, because of the betrayal. And I just don't know if I could get that across, like mm -hmm. that it's not just Riley dying and that it's, I'm not just in mourning and I'm just I'm pissed and mm -hmm. they don't have to shoot people. They just don't, you know, uh, we're not that dangerous and that they go, that that's their go-to is a big problem. So, you know, I've, uh, I've been advocating for better, for sure, better training, you know, and, and to know what their training is because we don't, really know what's going on at the police academy you know are, are they trained to negotiate what's their negotiation tactic drop your weapon or i'll shoot but they didn't even give riley that option no one said i'm going if you don't drop that weapon i'm going to shoot you they didn't tell riley at 60 seconds you know so it, it's a lot yeah. And in either way, what based on Riley's call, the 911 call, even if they didn't put together that he was calling, kind of reporting himself, they they knew they were responding to someone in the midst of a mental health crisis. And there are countless stories that even I've come across that prove to me without a doubt that the police often always seem to fall down when dealing with a mental health crisis. Um, and that's something your advocacy work has based on it has been based on as well as the idea of increased training or support in responding to a mental and health crisis you know, deviate like we do as you know I, i'm a first responder i've come upon scene many a scenes where the person is drunk uh, someone who's diabetic and is having a you know has low blood sugar can be very violent someone yeah. who's who's on drugs or and, or very pissed off or angry or, or just sick can be very angry. You have to talk to the person. Mm -hmm. A child that's having a fit, if you're yelling at the he's just, and adults do that. Mm -hmm. When adults argue, if you raise the tone, you're the next thing you know, you're shouting at each other. Mm -hmm. Riley was clearly in distress when they arrived there. He was right there for them to see. You know, it wasn't an ambush. You know, they were worried about an ambush. They were worried about this. They knew the SWAT guy was coming. They knew the trained professional was a mile away, a kilometer away. He was a minute away. They knew all of these things. They spent seven minutes on the phone with the said caller. He didn't, the caller did not say he felt danger. He was really saying he was in crisis amongst themselves on the radio, the like the 911 dispatch talking to them. It's they're always saying crisis. You hear it often. It's a boy in crisis. He's all dressed in black. He's got a backpack on. He's got a backpack on. You know, it's uh, it's so they they knew what they were coming. They they spent seven minutes deciding what they were going to do they said well she's going to try in french and if that doesn't work we're going to talk in english but then when you read their or hear their declarations is 
it sounds like three people are talking to him at the same time. So which is it, you know, and, and why did the prosecutor not look at all of that information? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I know the law says that they can do this, but it has to be reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to be proportionate as well. You know, like I understand that they didn't know that Riley could shoot at any minute, but they were barricaded behind their cars. They had their cars for protection. They have their body armor and they're trained for those situations, mm -hmm. you know, they're, or they're supposed to be. And, and they're not being called because it's an easy situation. Like when you're calling the cops, it's because you as, as a, an individual can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping to have more rational minds, you know, like, I mean, you go to any hospitals or in psychiatric wards, you know, that there's patients there that are violent and that are perhaps dangerous and they're not just killing them, you know? So it's a go-to and they're not accountable because first of all, they have no body cams. There's no dash cam. They never leave any witnesses. And, you know, uh, the only witnesses are each other as in Riley's case. Yeah, and that, you know, and I I hate to put them, and I don't want to put them all in the same category and say, but I don't believe it's a bad apple. Mm -hmm. I truly believe that the orchard itself has become rotten, and that, and I think that's anybody who works anywhere in a corporate world understands that you are the little guy, and if you want to stick out, if you want to fit in and stick around, you have to go with the flow. You can't be a squeaky wheel going, hey, you were really rude to that woman when you were giving her a ticket. Mm -hmm. And you were really rude to that homeless guy. Like, can you imagine being a cop and spending your day telling your fellow officers you're going to be either laughed off the squad or you're going to not be protected? So it's it's beyond the police and i will add that the police are getting a bad rap nowadays so who's joining the police academy who's volunteering it it's not one guy who thinks he's going to make the difference because it, it won't take him very long to realize that he can't he might go into politics if he thinks he wants to make a, a real you know a difference so I worried about where they recruit, you know, like when I found out the name of the police officer who shot Riley, I was told to go to YouTube and look at hockey videos and maybe you would find him. And he used to play for Midget 3A. And I think you guys know about that in the East. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, we call that here, it's a lot of goons fighting, you know, the, you know, fighting and they recruit these types of people and that there's a lot of people in the police academy in Quebec at Nicolet who used to play for the Valsijar, who used to play for, you know, Victoriaville, all these uh, hockey teams. So that's a trick if you want to see if they used to play hockey wow. and, and this guy used to spend a lot of time on the penalty box. And it's before 2005, so it's too bad because if it was more recent, there'd probably be more videos mm. of him there. Yeah, and, uh, and let's end with this. As you, you mentioned YouTube there, um, a lot of people have learned your story and Riley's story through the mainstream press and the reporting on, on this case. But you've also shared a lot of intimate and personal details in like a series of videos on YouTube, which I think is unusual for someone, for, for like a mother... Uh, to, to just sit in front of a YouTube camera or in front of a web camera on YouTube telling a story. Like, tell me the process of deciding to share, you know, the intimate details of, of the story in these YouTube videos. Well, it was a lot of like, um, well, I just knew it was wrong. And a lot of people were asking me about it. Uh, when I, when Riley passed, uh, that's how I, I, got through my life I got I was unable to read a book I can't read and it's hard for me to watch movies because it's too much concentrating you have to pay attention so I started doing you watching YouTube and I started to watch like do makeup YouTube videos all right then I found true crime and I've always been a fan of true crime I've always read uh 
you know, like uh, O.J. Simpson. I've read all those autobiographies, those biographies, or not the biographies, but the stories mm -hmm. I've read about, you know, Anne Rule, I, I know. And, you know, John, I always have been a fan of true crime, I guess, and uh, knowing things in the neighborhood. So I was like, why not? You know, I, I wanted my story to get out. Um, I know a lot of my friends uh, wanted to ask me questions. A lot of the people in the community wanted to ask me questions. But the minute I start talking and I get a little water in my eye, everybody like shuts down. And it means I'm like, these are tears of joy that you're asking me to speak about my son, that you're trusting me enough to hear my story and to believe that, you know, maybe it could be you, you know, I, I think that my story can resonate to a lot more people um, than, you know, and, and I hate to bring the, the race issue, but I, I don't have a stake in it, like, not that there is a stake in it, but like I, I have privilege and I wanted to use it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm fortunate, you know, I was given some skills, uh, some talents in my life and being able to communicate is one of them. Um, truly trying to help other people to better themselves and to understand that, you know, Riley wasn't a bad guy. I, I did it a lot to defend him. Mm -hmm because I didn't like what I was hearing and I didn't like that his depression was being used to justify shooting him in the head because I don't believe he deserved that. I don't think he was given a chance. So, you know, uh, I, I figured I'd, I'd give a go at it. Um, you know, I, I plan to get back into it. Uh, you know, I want to talk a little bit too about my grief. So maybe I have a separate channel, but um, I think it's important for, for other families that are dealing with this to know what they're up against because you really don't know. And by the time, and what happens in, in death, in violent death, because I've suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder from another incident. So I, I got, I've seen psychologists, so I've got some good tools is that talking is the best thing. Mm -hmm. Talking to people, whether they're listening or not, it's what we do as first responders when we have bad incidents is we just go and we talk about it for a month if we have to. You just want to do that. You know, if you win the lottery, you want to tell everybody, you know, whether it's good things or bad things, we want to talk about it. So I said, well, you know, what better way than a camera? And that way, if my friends wanted to know more intimate details and without having to live through the, the, the tears and the, cause it can get angry too, a little bit too mm -hmm. at times. And when I'm on the camera, it's different for me. And I feel like I grieve differently because the first year of grief, when it's the most important in an investigation like this, you're not usually, you know, I, I would say for most people, you're, you're, you're in a fog and you're, you're grief stricken. But I think because of my education and being a first responder and reaching out to people who were like me really made me want to do that. So, so um, subscribe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There'll be more. Yeah. So um, unless there's any, I'm going to end it here unless there's anything else you want to say or want to get into about, about your story or Riley's. No. We could do a, a follow up, you know, with the inquiry. I'm going to try to get it as public as possible. When, when is that? Is it scheduled yet or is it still tentative? Well, it hasn't been scheduled, but I've had a lot of conversations with the coroner because she doesn't know I have a lawyer yet. It's like, I'm telling you, this is the key. Do not hire a lawyer. Because, oh, they, and it's too bad, you know. But anyway, so she told me December of 2021. Okay. You want to try to do it before Christmas? The uh, the prosecutor who's helping the coroner, or the coroner who's taking charge, is uh, coming back from maternity leave, because the last coroner decided to do politics, go into politics. Oh. So that's another thing, you know. Our institutions are a mess. Oh, oh yeah, Canada. yeah. Mm -hmm. so.